All right, so I think we can get started. Um, so first of all, thank you so much um, to everyone who has come and join us on this Wednesday evening. Um, we are here with Dr. Andrew Blackwood again, who we thank you so much and we are very, very interested in all your knowledge um, and expertise. Um, I know a lot of people that are here with us today are super excited that you are back with us to be sharing a lot more. Um, so uh, for today's topic, I know Andrew Blackwood will be speaking about the forgiveness and impact on mental health. Um, so um, let's not wait anymore. Um, let us welcome Dr. Andrew Blackwood, who is here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. What a warm welcome. You're good at this. It makes me want to come back again and again and again and again and again. Um, what I'm going to do here, um, let's see, I'm going to admit all. I'm going to actually also um, take off the waiting room so people don't have to um, uh, do that. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so good to be with you all again tonight. Um, and just a little housekeeping, if everyone can remember to mute themselves, there will be a time where we'll take questions later. And at that point, um, Nicole will help me out and we'll go through people with questions. And then when it's your turn, um, you can unmute yourself. But um, sometimes if you get kicked out and you hop back on, um, just be sure to um, mute yourself again, because sometimes you come in and we don't want to be hearing everybody's stuff, their private stuff. So uh, mute yourself as much as you can. Um, and for those of you who haven't met me yet, you will see that I'm a very interactive and engaging person. So um, I love questions. So be sure to be courageous and bold and ask them. And um, you can put them in the chat or just um, write them down until the time comes. But I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it works tonight. And um, we will get started. All right. Can everybody see that? Excellent, excellent, excellent. So as Nicole mentioned, we are talking about forgiveness tonight. Forgiveness and the importance of it and the impact of it or the lack of it on our mental health. Now, I've been in the field as a mental health professional for, um, it's May, so May 5th, yes, it is 17 years now, yay me, 17 years, um, and I have journeyed with so many people through pain, um, and myself included, and um, oftentimes, and I come from a, a, a Christian background and people of faith have a high value for forgiveness. And as we talk through it tonight, you'll see some of the benefits, but I want to start off with some of the challenges of forgiveness, the things that we often overlook, because I hear people, you know, hurrying people to forgive. And as much as it is a, a blessing and a good thing, um, it's important to be intentional about how we do that and how we encourage and support others to forgive. Uh, because whenever we talk about forgiveness, um, yes, it comes from a good place, but sometimes our hurry moves people to skip over something, skip over something that's really, really important. And that thing is loss, loss. Um, because the only reason why there's a need for forgiveness is because there's a loss. There's been some sort of hurt, violation, betrayal of something, some sort of hurt, some sort of pain. And when we move people to forgive quickly, not that it's not important, but when we move them to forgive quickly, sometimes they don't have an opportunity to grieve, to acknowledge their loss. And that is important. That is an important part of our mental health, <laughs> right? So we're going to talk about that. Before we get into grief, we're going to talk about loss. And I, I don't know if you watch the news. I don't, okay? I don't watch the news. 
but you have to be like live in some remote place and talk to nobody not to know that stuff's going on in the world. And most recently, there's another tragedy, uh, a mass shooting in Buffalo, right? There's a lot of pain, a lot of pain for that city, for the people, for the individuals, people who have lost uh, family members, coworkers, friends. It's important to acknowledge the loss, right? Yes, I do believe there's room for, give, for forgiveness and I do think there's benefit for forgiveness, but it's important to acknowledge loss, right? And we're gonna talk a little bit more about loss and, and, and grieving uh, because it's important for us to understand that there is loss and then there's life after loss, okay? There's grief, there's grieving, and we can grow through grieving, but it is very much a process, okay? It's very much a process. So before we talk about forgiveness in depth, we're gonna talk a little bit about grieving. Let's talk about grief. What is grief, okay? Grief is the pain you feel when you experience loss, okay? And we go into mourning, okay? Mourning is when you go through the motions and you acknowledge that loss. Grieving is a part of that, right? Grieving is an experiential acknowledgement of loss, right? So when there is loss, you know, we talked a little bit about the, um, over the years, I don't know if you've heard about it, but it was the five stages of grief. Many people have heard about that, right? There's denial anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, and then it evolved, right? Then there were seven stages of grief, including, you know, hope and, you know, uh, other parts. And then there were 12 stages of grief, right? So our understanding of grieving is, is, is going to continue to grow. And I'm going to ask my children to be quiet. Hold on one moment. Ladies, I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so when we think about grief, it's important that we are going to be able to expand our understanding of what it means to grieve because you can lose someone or something and not actually have a healthy process of grieving, okay? Sometimes we, we're stuck in shock, right? We're shocked, we're in shock right? We might be mourning, but we haven't gone through a process of grieving, right? So again, it's about acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is important. So I already mentioned here that, you know, there's different kinds of grief. There's different kinds of grief. You can, you can lose a person, okay? You can lose someone to death, right? But you can also lose a thing that is really important to you. People lose limbs, people lose mobility, people lose uh, memory, right? People you lose um, pets and things of sentimental value. People can lose innocence. People can lose so many different things. So when we grieve, we wanna move beyond the idea of it's just about a person because grief and loss is so personal. In this picture, you see a little girl there. A lot of the times when we think death, we, we, we think, you know, she can't possibly understand grief and loss. But there's so many things that little children grieve. There's so many things that children lose in their lives. For example, when you move, when you move from one city to the next or from one neighborhood to the next, you lose friends. For children, that's really important. You might lose a teacher. You might lose the comfort of a school. For some people, you might lose the tree in your backyard. <laughs> Believe it or not, that can have some significance. So it's important that we take the time, regardless of age, to acknowledge and to learn what loss is and what it means for other people. So as we're talking about the connection between mental health and grief, we can see there's connections between grief, loss, trauma, and our mental health. So some of what we're gonna talk about, we'll touch briefly on things that we've looked at before, um, but review is really good. So let's talk about mental health. And I know sometimes we use the term interchangeably or we 
with ment mental health, with mental illness, mental wellness, there are all these different terms. So I like to think about mental health in this way. It is our degree of wellness, right? So there is a beautiful thing about human beings. We're all different, okay? We are all different. We all come in different shapes and packages and sizes. We have different strengths. We have different uh, capacity. We have different degrees of um, intelligence. We have different language. We're also different, right? So it's important when we start to think about mental health, we think about the individual and their capacity, right? That's really important. So we don't expect people to be like everybody else. That's just unfair, right? Um, and then the other part that I think is important is with the understanding that everyone has their unique capacity. Now, mental health is actually the ability to access our individual capacity, right? To access our individual capacity. So just because somebody is different than another person doesn't mean that they bo both cannot have equal levels of access to their capacity, right? Mental health and mental wellness is about being our best self. And that's really, really important. We talked a little bit about um, trauma and what trauma looks like and what it feels like and what impact that it has on us. So similar to grief, trauma is, can be different for everyone, right? We, sometimes we can even use those terms interchangeably. When somebody experiences grief, they experience trauma, right? Grief can be traumatic. There's all different kinds of loss, right? So for somebody who you know, is losing, let's say somebody who is in their 50s, for example, and their parent or their grandparent is passing. Their grandparent probably has lived a really full and long life, right? And if they're dying of old age and they have a belief system that says, you know what, they're going to a better place, that loss is going to be personal, but that may be very different than a woman who loses her child, right? Like, that continuum of life, that progression has been interrupted for this particular person in a very different way. So when we think about trauma and we think about grief, we can acknowledge it's a disruption in the normal progression of growth and development in life. That's a good, my, I believe it's a good understanding of trauma. It's important to understand that. Grief can be traumatic. So if a child loses a parent, that's a disruption in a normal phase of development. Their whole world has changed. Their life is forever different. If they lose a pet, <laughs> you don't know how that impacts them. Right now they're exposed to loss and death, maybe at a very young age, right? Sometimes children can be so worried about their parents dying. They don't necessarily have the words or the language for it, but now all of a sudden they're faced with the reality that you know, something bad can happen to my parent and what will happen to me, right? So when that happens to us as children, whether it's a loss of a parent or some sort of significant loss or trauma, sometimes it can press pause on our development, okay? Like literally, I say this to people as I'm working with them and we're working through issues and they don't realize- I'm hearing it. You want me to move volume? No. For us. Let me find who I can mute. Let's see. Who can I who do I get to mute? Do you still have the ability to mute Nicole? Or is it just me now? Um, I think I still no, I think you do, Dr. Blackwood. Okay. I have I have all the power. <laughs> <laughs> do I know how to use it? Is the question. Um, okay, so I I, I think they've muted themselves, but just for future reference. Okay, there we go. I know how to do it now. Okay, so um, where was I? Yeah, pressing um, pause on our emotional development. When I'm working with people and time after time, we, we kind of look at how they are reacting to life in real time. The person can be 45, 55, even 65, 
And when they look at how they're re responding, reacting is different than responding. So when they look at how they react, react is kind of reflex. You're not really thinking about it. Whereas response is an intentional kind of consideration of what's going on. And then you choose your action. You are response able, responsible, response able. When people are reacting, they're usually acting out of a really younger place. Although they may be 65, in some ways, their reaction is less mature, right? So it's important to think about trauma and grief and when we started to experience trauma and when we start to experience grief and loss in our childhood, because those parts of us, if we do not resolve those things, if we do not allow ourselves to either fully grieve or to really dig into how those losses and those traumas have impacted us, then part of us may not have grown through that experience, right? And that tends to move us to extremes, right? Our reactions, they're pretty intense. And again, it can be intense, like overt angry, or it could actually be in intensely passive, like we ignore, we avoid, we, we live as if nothing has happened, right? Either extreme is not helpful. It's not healthy, right? So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to integrate our loss, okay? Integrate our loss. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But essentially what that means is we want to be able to acknowledge our loss and reconcile that loss with the rest of life, okay? reconcile our losses with the rest of life. And what I mean by that, we want to be able to hold those two things. Something tragic has happened, yet I'm okay, <laughs> right? For a lot of people, the two can't coexist. So we spend our lives thinking I'm not okay because something tragic can happen any moment. So when we heal and we work through our trauma and we work through our grief, we're better able to hold those two realities, right? Because sometimes trauma and grief and loss or the fear of further loss and grief moves us to try to control things and control people, right? We try to control our circumstances. We get controlling in relationships, right? We can't handle stuff, so we avoid it to take control of our emotions. So what do we do? We drink, we smoke, we do all sorts of stuff. And it's camouflaged by what's cool, right? Or we're coping. But in reality, there's some unresolved stuff there, okay? So what I'm really wanting to do here is make a connection for us uh, between what we experience in terms of loss and grief and, um, and trauma, right? Because ultimately, when I was talking about reconciling things, we're really talking about life on a belief level, okay? When we look at people, we see their behavior, right? And a lot of times we can see the emotions, but what we don't see are the beliefs that are fueling the emotions that are contributing to the behaviors. And if we want long lasting change, this is what we wanna get really good at understanding and recognizing beliefs. Beliefs can start big or they can start small, but they grow throughout our lives and they grow in our minds and our relationships and literally our entire lives. We're led by beliefs. So when people experience loss, human, human beings, we, we tend to come to conclusions about life based on that loss, based on that experience. We automatically try to integrate that. So my mom, my dad hurt my mom. There are lots of different beliefs that can come as a result of that. Some people walk away thinking all men hurt women. That's a belief, right? Some people walk away thinking, you know what? Um, when you get married, there's going to be hurt in marriage. It's going to end in divorce. So there's no point in marriage, right? You hear those conclusions that people come to, right? Sometimes they, they read a stat. It's some statistic that says this happens, this happens. So people come to conclusions. And those silent conclusions are beliefs, right? And they can go down to the very core of our being, and they inform how we live without us even knowing. So it's really, really important that we start to 
think about ourselves and think about people, not just in a behavioral sense, not just in an emotional sense, but what are the beliefs that are driving those behaviors? When you think about mental health, it's so important to understand how our beliefs, not just our experiences, our beliefs, our interpretations of those experiences, right? It's our interpretation, right? The silent conclusions that we come to based on our experience, which is also based on our age and stage of development. So when a seven-year-old experiences something, their interpretation and their internalizing of that thing is going to be quite different than a 27 year old, most likely, right? So it's really important as we love and support people that we appreciate um, their lives on a belief level. So I want you to kind of throw something in the chat. I'm just gonna bounce back to this um, communal trauma. What do you think is the impact on these people? What do you think these people who experience this loss real, real time, or maybe even people who experience a similar loss in a different country, right? What do you think their beliefs are at this moment? What do you think is going through their hearts and their minds? Talk back to me, throw it in the chat. What silent conclusions are some people coming to? And some, some people are expressing them, right? Some people are expressing them on the news, right? Yeah, some people are thinking life is not fair. Can you see how people would come to that conclusion? Yeah, people are experiencing anger and frustration because this is not the first racially motivated shooting and, and massacre. This is not the first time, right? Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts about beliefs and, and conclusions that people are coming to? Life is not fair. What about it's not safe? It's not safe for me to go outside. It's not safe for me to go to the grocery store. What about this is never going to change? What about nobody's doing anything about this? What about if somebody's gonna do something about it, it's got to be me, right? The only way to fight violence is with violence. A lot of people can come to conclusions, right? And those conclusions are going to fuel action, right? When is this gonna stop, right? That is a thought, okay? And if this thought, which is a very natural expression, comes to mind, it's in the form of a question. And I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but a lot of the times we express our thoughts in the form of a question. But beneath this question might be some beliefs. When is this going to stop as a question? But the answer to that question is never for some people. This is never going to stop, right? And if we are believing this is never going to stop, if we believe that life is not fair, what's that going to roll into for us? past the anger, past the aggression, there's likely going to be some depression. If people are believing, I can't go out, there's going to be some anxiety, right? Not some, lots. This is trauma, okay? This is communal trauma, right? You're going to be, people are going to be seeing this every day of their lives. They're going to walk, walk they're going to walk by that store, see the tape, right? They're going to feel that fear or that rage. This is going to impact their lives. It's important to think about that. Because how does this impact our lives? We've talked about the quality of life on a spectrum before, right? There is existing, then there's coping, then there's living, then there's thriving, right? Existing is just where you wake up and you just hardly get through the day. You're just barely breathing. And then coping is where we do whatever it takes, again, to get through the day, right? Living, excuse me, when we talk about living, we've actually moved past coping. Because coping does not always lead to change, 
If you have healthy coping strategies, they may take us closer to change, but change is what we experience when we're actually living, when we're actually addressing our issues effectively. And then when you're into thriving, you look for every opportunity in a challenge and you, you're like, yes, let's do this. You have all your needs met, you have a level of confidence and you're thriving, okay? When we experience trauma and grief and loss and we are coming to some conclusions, some silent conclusions, and it's impacting us on a belief level, you can see where that might position us, right? Life is not fair. This is never going to stop. That sense of powerlessness, that's not living, right? That knocks us down to coping, right? We're just trying to get through. We're just trying to survive, right? So grief and loss happens to us all on various degrees. And we all walk away, whether we know it or not, with certain beliefs, right? That's why I encourage people to uh, spend time journaling because we get really familiar with ourselves and the way that we think as we journal, okay? Journaling doesn't just have to be, I did this today and I did that today, um, nor is it just this happened to me last year or certain parts of my life. It's really about what do I believe about that? What does that experience say to me or about me or about God or about life? We want to explore our beliefs because when we understand ourselves, then we can experience change, right? So we talked a little bit about beliefs, right? Some of the possible beliefs. And if your belief is a future-based belief and it's negative, like this is never going to change, that's going to contribute to an anxious perspective. And we know that anxiety can often roll over into depression, right? Two of the major disorders that are categorized by certain mental health professionals come from these beliefs. And I know that there is a whole vast experience of you know, uh, differences in our chemistry, our biological chemistry, our genetics. Those play a role as well. Uh, yet by and large, whether or not it starts on a chem chemical level, we have thoughts that we get to address, that we can learn how to address. So that's where we want to be able to uh, experience change, right? Now, I hope you guys are coming up with some questions um, because I look forward to that part when we get there. But I want to ask you just to throw some things in the chat again. What do you think might be the impact of stress and trauma, grief, hate, anger, and unforgiveness. How do you think it impacts people? Throw some things in the chat. A negative mindset. Yes, certainly. If you experience trauma and you come to conclusions about life and, you know, my life is never going to change, you know what, they're right, There's, I'm not going to achieve anything in life, or every time I try something, something bad happens, so, you know, I forget it, I might not as well do that. You can cultivate a negative mindset. It's never going to work. Good things don't happen to me, right? Certainly. Overthinking, I hear that a lot. And a lot of the times when I work with people about overthinking, we're really going to look at what are the actual thoughts because overthinking is usually negative thinking and it's usually anxiety provoking thoughts, right? For sure. Yeah. Stress. Let's talk about stress, right? There's good stress and then there's not so good stress, but either way, the body is not designed to live indefinitely with stress. We're just not made to, to deal with stress forever. So when we experience loss and it's not resolved, when we experience trauma and it's not resolved and you're imagining that every day over and over and over, of course, it's going to have an impact on you. Yes, you will be unhappy. Yes, you will likely experience depression, right? Because if you think about it, what happens to you when you feel anxious? What's happening in your body? There's a level of, of stress and of activation. It actually takes energy to be anxious, believe it or not. Your heart rate is going, right? Your breathing isn't the way it's supposed to be. You're not being refreshed. You're not sleeping well, 
right? You, when you when your when your nervous system is highly activated, you're not going to be eating well. So you're not eating well. You're not sleeping well, right? It informs the way that you see the world. So you might be hesitant to advocate for yourself or to connect with people, to to know people. It changes our relationships. And when you don't have good relationships, what's your mental health going to be like? Right? Fear, withdrawal, loss of dreams, right? All these things have an impact on our body. And we are like this comprehensive, wonderful thing of body, soul, and mind. Our mental wellness, our capacity to, to live and to be and to be in relations with people, it's impacted on a daily basis, right? Yes, addictions. That's definitely a, a, one of the expressions of loss and unresolved trauma and grief, okay? I, I'm, I'm hoping that we're all getting a clear sense that there is a direct connection between grief and loss and our mental health, right? Grief, loss, and mental health. So why am I making all these points? Well, because uh, we tend to skip over grief and loss, and just jump into forgiveness. And in terms of a treatment perspective, a way to address it, that's not very effective, right? When someone experiences violence or powerlessness and you tell them to forgive, <laughs> is that helpful? <laughs> no, it's not helpful. It may be very true. It may be very good, but if the timing is wrong, you're going to do more damage than you are good. Okay. Yes. Forgiveness is important. And before we talk about forgiving other people, let's talk about self-forgiveness. Okay. Because it's a step up, right? If you have trouble forgiving yourself, you're going to have trouble forgiving other people. Okay. So let's talk about self-forgiveness because a lot of people don't talk about it a lot. So when we have trouble forgiving ourselves, what does that look like? Well, that looks a lot like regret. When we've done something wrong, yes, we have regret. But regret is not the same as remorse. There's a difference, right? Regret is, I wish I never did that, right? I wish I never did that. I wish this didn't happen to me right? There's not this sense of sorrow. Remorse has a lot to do with sorrow. It has to do with other emotions. It has to do with sadness. It has to do with a pain that's not just regret, okay? And this is relevant when it comes to forgiving other people, but I want us to start with ourselves because nobody is perfect. When we look back at our lives, we often regret, well, some people don't believe in regret, I'm not one of those people. I mean, I'm not to the extreme, but the point is we nobody's perfect, right? We've all done and will do things that we have regret about, but regret often just lends to shame, okay? Shame is not where you just, just feel ashamed of doing something wrong, but shame is when you internalize that and say that I am wrong, I am bad, I am a bad person, person. How could I do such a thing? I must, I am the scum of the earth. I am right. And you beat up on yourself. You punish yourself. I will never forgive myself. I can never forgive myself. And here my alarm is going off. How do I turn off my alarm? Hold on one moment. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Hopefully, I don't have any more personal wonderful interruptions. Um, but yeah, punish yourself. Like, Andrew, how could you forget to turn off your alarm? Like, what the heck is wrong with you? You're a professional. Like, you should, you should know these things. You should have a better plan, right? There's all this judgment that could come along with shame, right? Remember, we talked earlier about uh, thought patterns, right? 
when we experience shame, we start to use and think from a place of all or nothing, like I am. It's conclusive, it's, it's extreme, right? A lot of the times when we experience grief and loss and it's unresolved, we have a hard time forgiving ourselves because we use all or nothing thinking, okay? Whereas healthy sense of experiences of self-forgiveness, you experience remorse. Like not only did you do something wrong, but that's cost you. A lot of the times we are so upset with ourselves because we have internal conflict when we've done something wrong. I know better, but I did it anyways, or I contradicted some of my values. It's important important to see your own pain. That is really, really important. Because when we start to look at it on a deeper level, then we start to experience empathy. Okay. Empathy and understanding for ourselves. How could I do such a thing? Well, let's think about it. What are the factors that contributed to you doing that? Think about it, right? What was going through your mind? What have you experienced earlier in life that contributed to you? thinking that way and making those decisions, right? Because only when we do that, can we then have an understanding and understanding is what leads to growth and change. We don't just want our children or people to just change their behavior. Yes, it's better than them doing horrible things, but changes in behavior don't usually last forever, right? They're temporary because people don't fully understand, right? So let's talk a little bit about empathy. Empathy, we've talked about before, but just a little bit of a review. Empathy is about feeling and caring about what others feel, right? Some people, they have very little empathy, if any at all. But what's interesting is when we are able to have empathy for ourselves, then we experience self-compassion, right? That's an important ingredient when it comes to forgiving oneself having compassion for oneself. We're not talking about making excuses for inappropriate behavior or wrong decisions. We're not making excuses. We're talking about the road to change, which is paved with understanding. When you understand, then you can say, oh, that's how and why I did what I did. There is an understanding and you can have compassion for yourself. And that's important because how we treat ourselves is ultimately how we treat other people, right? Sometimes we talk about forgiveness. And if you have a hard time forgiving other people, you probably have a hard time forgiving yourself, right? Because we don't wanna say it's okay. And forgiveness is not saying it's okay, right? It's not. Forgiveness is definitely not forgetting. Some people say forgive and forget. I don't believe it. That's not my policy at all. Not my policy at all. Forgiveness is not about feeling better either. Okay. Sometimes you will forgive and you will not feel better right away. You don't have to feel better in order to forgive. Right. Quite often you make the decision and the emotions come, they catch up. But I talk about it in the art of a genuine apology. Um, the book that I wrote, I talk a little bit about forgiveness as well as um, the apology, the genuine apology, as well as reconciliation. And the three of them, they intersect and they weave together nicely, but they're very different things, right? I talk a little bit about you'll have reminders and invitations to forgive again. That's another way of saying you might get triggered by something, right? Just because you forgive once doesn't mean that you'll never get a chance to forgive that same offense again. A lot of the times it's gonna move you to a deeper level, a deeper awareness of what it is that you've lost. Forgiveness has everything to do with loss, right? Okay, and some people think, think forgiveness is about fairness. Well, it's not fair, so I'm not gonna forgive, right? Or you know what, you didn't apologize, so I'm not gonna forgive you. You haven't acknowledged what you did. You haven't paid for it, so I'm not gonna forgive you. Forgiveness is not about fairness. They don't deserve forgiveness. Maybe they don't. But ultimately, forgiveness is not necessarily about them, right? Forgiveness is not conditional whether or not they apologize or whether or not they've learned their lesson. That's something different. That's reconciliation. 
Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Just because you forgive doesn't mean you are automatically reconciled. You can forgive someone and know that they are not trustworthy, right? Somebody punches you in the face, you can forgive them. But um, are you going to get up all up in their face and let them have, you know, access to punch you in the face again? That's your choice. But unless they've demonstrated that they understand and they've made some changes and they're getting some help to take care of themselves, then you might want to consider reconciliation, which is, you know, an extension of forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is, let's talk about what it is. Forgiveness is saying, I am okay, or I will be okay. I forgive you, right? When my children, when I apologize to my children, because I'm not perfect, and I might do or say things that are hurtful to them, I acknowledge and I apologize, right? I go through all the steps and I apologize. And they say, it's okay, daddy. And I, and I tell them, I say, I appreciate that. However, it's not okay. <laughs> I tell them it's not okay. My behavior is not okay. That's why I'm apologizing, right? It's a subtle message, but it's an important one. And I encourage them to say, I'm okay, right? They can let me know I'm okay. I, I forgive you. They can say those things. I'll be okay, right? But don't say it's okay because it's not. It's not, okay? The behavior is not okay. Forgiveness is about remembering. Some people say forgive and forget. I disagree. My, I, it's opposite. I say remember. It's important not just to say that I'm going to remember every time I see you. That's not the memory I'm talking about. I'm talking about to look at what it is that you've lost. Consider how it impacted you. So you forgive that whole experience. When I say forgive that whole experience, it's really about you get to grieve that. You get to acknowledge what you've lost. You get to acknowledge how life is different. Before you even have a conversation with the person, you get to forgive. You get to go through that process because forgiveness is about the future. Forgiveness is not as much about the past as it is about the future. Not just the future, but your future, okay? A lot of people have a hard time forgiving others because they believe that life will never be the same for them, number one, which is true to some extent, but more importantly, they believe life will never be as good as it could have been. That is a big barrier for people when it comes to forgiving. They don't believe they can have the life that they wanted or a wonderful life, a life that they believe that they were worthy of or deserving of right? A life that God had planned for them, a life of goodness, of wonderful things. They don't believe that. They don't believe life can be good, so they don't forgive for that reason. Forgiveness is about the future. But when you forgive, you're actually embracing, I'm okay, and I can and will still have a wonderful future. Forgiveness is about freedom, your freedom, right? When you forgive, you're actually carrying the past into the future, but carrying it very differently, okay? And then forgiveness can be a step towards reconciliation, right? This is a picture. Forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. I love this picture because of two things. When they are holding hands, there's, you know, the idea that there's a connection, there's a healing there, right? Hand in hand. But most importantly, they are moving into the future together. They are traveling the same road together. There's a proverb in Amos that says, how can two walk, walk lest they agree? That is the perfect question that speaks to reconciliation. Reconciliation is not the same as an apology. It's not the same as forgiveness. Reconciliation is about agreement. We're going to move forward, and this is how we're going to move forward. This is how I am going to be responsible. This is how I'm going to change my life so that we can move forward, so that we can both experience what we want together, right? Forgiveness is not about reconciliation. So as we think about the people who are experiencing loss, and, you know, even in Buffalo or wherever we are in the world, it's important to realize we don't want to rush people. To forgive. What we want to rush people to do is take care of themselves, acknowledge their loss, 
and to move through a process. I shouldn't even say rush. I would say we want to prioritize and put it in order. That's better, right? We want to put things in order. Let's grieve first. Let's acknowledge our loss. Let's ensure that we are safe and we're okay. And as we move forward, then we think about now that I've processed this or as I process this, you know what? I want to be free, right? I want to move forward. I want to live a life of purpose, right? And what you have done is not going to stop me. In fact, what you've done can actually fuel my purpose, okay? So I talked a little bit about genuine apology. We won't get into it a lot now, but as we experience loss and we think about mental health and we think about relationships, they're all connected. Um, so, you know, like I'm pretty sure my children are going to offer me an apology tonight. I, I hope so because they're distracting me with all this noise they're making outside my office. So we're gonna have to do something about that. But uh, genuine apology, again, it's a comprehensive way of effectively identifying and addressing emotional injury. Okay, both our own, that's a self-forgiveness piece, right? We want to understand how that works and those are the people we care about. We want to forgive ourselves. And when people address us, we want to give them the opportunity to say, well, you missed this piece. I don't know if you realize this is what I lost as a result of you doing this. So when they offer an apology, we can say, well, yeah, but I want you to understand that this is the impact it's had on me. So even though I forgive you, you've got some work to do so that I know that this isn't going to happen again. Like, how are you going to live your life differently? So all of these things really do impact our mental health, right? Uh, a resource I definitely want to share with you all is um, journaling. Because if you want to feel better, thinking better is absolutely essential. Um, I, and we're going to bounce into questions shortly but I like to throw this link into the chat. So if anybody's interested in a, a free resource for um, learning how to journal effectively, um, you're welcome to access that. Um, and yes, support, support. I, we're not designed to do life alone. We're just not supposed to. We're never meant to do that. So if you need support, by all means, reach out, whether it's to me or to any of the staff members on Youth Now on Track. You know, there are lots of um, uh, call numbers, toll-free numbers that we can call to get help when we need it. So um, let's not uh, deprive ourselves of, of supports, okay? So um, that concludes my, my talk, but now it's the exciting part. Does so anybody have any questions about forgiveness, the importance of it, and the impact on mental health that we can talk about? Doctor, I have a question here. This is Pastor Francis. Hi, Pastor Francis. How are you, sir? Thank you very much. That's awesome. You're we I do appreciate the, the presentation. You are able to cover a lot. My question here is simple. A lot of people called vindictiveness justice. So can you a bit uh, give more light, throw more light on what is vindictiveness and justice and also forgiveness? Yeah, sure. So I could, I could see why people think that vindictiveness is the same as justice. Um, so when we are vindictive, it's like we're doing things to get back at people, right? Again, we're trying to make things fair, right? That's essentially what vindictiveness is. Um, whereas justice, I don't think is just about fairness. Justice takes into consideration a lot more than just the individual perspective and the individual's needs, right? Justice has to do with um, the larger society. It's not just the person. Yes, it has to do with right or wrong, but I think justice also takes into consideration the factors that contributed to the, what somebody did, right? It's, I think it's more of a collective experience when we think about justice, not just me. Well, this happened to me, so I'm going to make sure it happens back to you. Like, you know, I'm going to take it back to you. So 
justice, vindictiveness is also like about punishment, right? I'm punishing you, right? I want you to suffer because I've suffered. And that's not really what justice is about, right? Because the truth is when we heal, we move from a place of just desiring punishment. Just, justice can be served, right? But I guess the question is, what's going on in the heart of the person when they want to see justice? Are they wanting somebody to suffer? Is that really what they want? Because justice doesn't necessarily come from a place of desiring someone to suffer, right? For me, when people are vindictive, it's not just about one incident. It, it becomes a way of living. This is how we interact with people. You do me wrong, I'm gonna do you wrong back. And how, how do you live? Because everybody is going to, <laughs> nobody's perfect. People are gonna hurt you. I, and I tell my little ones, like your sister did something wrong to you. Does that mean you do it back? Like, is that, do two wrongs make a right? No, no, it doesn't. So I'm not saying that in justice, there is no punishment. I'm really wanting to focus on the heart of the individual. Seek healing for yourself because if your healing is tied to their punishment, then what happens if they never get punished? <laughs> then you're left unhealed because they didn't get punished, right? So I wouldn't encourage people to seek uh, retribution in that way for those reasons. Um, it's better to live a life where you're free and you're healed and you're whole. Yes, you may be limping because you've gone through some pain, um, but that's not the way to live a vindictive life. So I, I, I trust that answers the question, sir. Yes, yes, you did. Thank you very much. I think there's a follow-up question there. And thank you so, so much. You did answer the question. It's, it's You're good. so welcome. You're so welcome. Okay, so I'm going to read this. Um, I know this uh, question came into me directly. So um, somebody said, I feel like every time I forgive and move um, past my child's father, whom always disappears from her life when he's mad at me, it brings me back again. And I want to cut him away from her. But it's repetitive. Every time I feel I heal or move on, he hurts her emotions again I feel helpless as a mother wow well my heart goes out to you it really really does and you highlight a really good point sometimes when our, our children are hurt we feel hurt and it's it gets all tangled right it, it definitely gets tangled up and I think it's important to realize that people have unresolved hurts in their life and that's why they choose to do what they do they don't do what they do because of what you do did. They do what they did because of unresolved hurts, right? That's their choosing to live a certain way. Um, and when I think about families, I think generationally. So there's probably a pattern that came before him, right? That there's room for healing for himself. So it's important that as, you know, we look at we how we engage we can be intentional about engaging in ways that are fair and that are loving and that are safe even with people who have hurt us fair loving and safe those are important things to consider but we also want to think about the generation like how are we responding to the hurt of our children when they're disappointed we talked earlier about beliefs and this is why it's so good to understand beliefs and how they work because our children are going to be interpreting things and we can play a role in how they interpret things, right? But if we're not aware and we're not intentional, then they're just gonna take it in, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, I was just observing my daughter and one of her interactions with a friend and I could tell that she was hurt and she was upset about it. So when we came home, I was asking her, so what's going through your mind? How are you feeling about this situation? And she would talk about it. And, you know, she acknowledged, well, you know, I don't feel special. I don't feel important. And we were able to talk about it and say, okay, well, just because you don't feel special and don't feel important, does that mean that you're not? Right? Feelings are not facts. You don't have to feel important to be important. 
You don't have to feel loved to know that you are loved. And she was able to appreciate that even at such a young age. And I imagine this is a lesson will probably come over again and again and again, because I didn't learn that lesson until I was in my 30s, okay, <laughs> right? But it's a generational pattern. So I don't want you to feel hopeless and powerless in light of other people's decisions. You can still impact generational change by learning how to deal with pain, learning how to understand those thoughts and help your child to process that loss, right? I was telling a group of parents the other day, like gone are the days when you can just be a loving parent. No, 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 that's not, that's not good enough. Now we have the capacity to understand how thoughts work. So we can support our, ch our children with care and competence, right? That's one of the reasons why I'm doing a lot more of support with parents to help their kids, particularly with anxiety and dealing with hurt. So it's a good question. And I don't want you to believe that you are helpless because of somebody else's behaviors, right? We can impact change in the next generation. So thank you for that, that question and that comment. Um, so the next question we have here, when people say they leave everything to God, that vengeance belongs to God, have they really forgiven? Well, it depends. Depends. One of the things that I encourage people to, to look at for themselves is do they want this person to suffer, right? If they want this person to suffer, then there's room to, for more forgiveness, right? Um, there's a difference between saying this person is not a safe person and I believe they shouldn't be incarcerated, right? Because it doesn't make sense that they're out free hurting other people. Right, there's been no remorse, there's been no change, there's no acceptance of responsibility, right? So um, that's different than, yeah, I want them to pay for what they did, right? Um, and I'm not saying it's not a natural reaction, but I think that's what really God is saying when he says, vengeance belongs to me, like I will take care of it. Um, yes, he's just, but I don't think he wants our hearts to be contaminated with hate right? Again, that goes back to how do we live when our hearts are feeding on hate and anger and a desire to see people, like your face, even your face is going to tell you something's wrong, right? You're not at peace when you want people to suffer, right? So I would, I would say that there's more room and for forgiveness when we still want people to suffer. And I do believe it's a process, right? Again, if you haven't gone through a grieving process, right? If you stop short, of, you know, if you're just stuck in that place where you believe life will never be good for me again, then yeah, you're going to feel bitter, right? If you don't have some sort of resolve and resolution about the losses you've experienced, then it will, you'll carry that with you in a way that... Um, it's just heavy. It's just heavy and consuming, right? Any other questions? I'm gonna scroll through to see if there are any hands are raised because you can raise your hands if you'd like or drop it in the chat. I have a question. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Azucena and I am Thank you so much for the talk. And, You're welcome, uh, Susanna. It's one kind of um, something that I'm all the time listening about the forgiveness because I know that it's very important. So the thing, the question is, uh, my daughter, uh, she did something wrong with her um, stepdad and she refuses to say, uh, to, to forgive. She said, mommy, yes, I, I know that I have to forgive, but I, I don't want it. Now I don't want it. So it, it, there is a time I have to leave her to, to take her time to, um, to forgive. Or can I say, please, you have to do it because at that time you're going to be, you're going to feel better because I know that she feels bad. And also her stepdad is going to change her, his attitude because he, he feels so bad, you know, since she did that. So what is the best thing that you can suggest me to do or to say to her about this? Or how can I motivate her or to prepare her to, to forgive, to, to ask 
Yes. How can I say to apologize, to do a genuine apologize to him and to receive and to do the, the forgiveness that is going to heal the both of them. Okay. So I know there's a, there's more to the story that I don't know. So I might be getting confused in some of the details, but it sounds to me like um, there, there's room for her to forgive, which means something was done that was wrong to her, but there's also room for her to apologize for what she's done. So um, let's separate those things and look, talk about the forgiveness part um, first. Um, so like we were talking about before, forgiveness is a really good thing. And when we position things in ways that tell people that they have to do it, they're going to feel pressured to do it and more likely not to do it. <laughs> right. So I wouldn't tell, I wouldn't encourage you to say that you have to forgive. Um, but uh, one of the things that's really important, because I believe we all want to feel good, we all want to feel better. So the chances are, if we're not forgiving, we're harboring this, this hate and this upset and this anger. And it's good to understand why people are holding on to that. Right? Because sometimes, again, like we talked earlier about, they haven't grieved, right? They've lost something was done to them that they're still sorting through. So it's, it might be, might be really useful to say, okay, well, you know what? What's stopping you from forgiving, right? How are you feeling? Are you still feeling hurt? Well, let's talk about that. Okay, so you, know, so you get an understanding. So you're not in a rush for her to forgive, but you're actually gonna be able to partner with her through the process of understanding what are the barriers to forgiveness or sometimes even using forgiveness, the word is too early. So you really wanna focus on, okay, well, what happened? How are you feeling? And what's causing you to feel that way, right? You really wanna help them process the loss. Um, so that's important. And then there are the benefits of forgiveness that you know she can read up on, right? It might not be about pushing her to have, excuse me, a conversation with someone as much as it might be, okay, well, do you want to carry this anger around with you, right? Forgiveness is, is for you, right? Because remember, forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. So she might think if I have to forgive, that means I'm saying it's okay. That means I'm ready to be back in the same sort of relationship with you. And if people think that and they don't want that, then they're not going to forgive. But forgiveness is not necessarily attached to being back in relationship with someone. So that's the forgiveness piece. With respect to the apology, um, there's if people haven't experienced apologies a lot, then they might not, one, uh, be so comfortable with it and they might not see the value of it. So I know that people are hesitant to apologize to other people who don't apologize, right? <laughs> right, especially adults. Good luck getting a teenager to apologize to an adult who doesn't admit when they're wrong. I, I don't even want that challenge. Like, and why would I even give that person the challenge? Why would I expect the younger person to apologize to the more mature person when they don't apologize, right? If anything, I would be like, okay, well, I know it's important for her to apologize to you, but have you apologized to her? Have you ever apologized to her for anything you've ever done? And somebody's like, I never did anything wrong. Mm, that's hard to believe, right? So um, that said, um, apologies, I, I would encourage you to get the book because there's a lot to it, but I will say this, that um, apologies, they're good for the person as well, right? When I see that I've hurt you, chances are um, I did something in a way that I'm not happy with, right? So even an example would be like, if I, if I said something to somebody, I meant what I said, but maybe how I said it or the timing, or the choice of words, or my tone, right? That can be hurtful, 
right? That can be disrespectful. And if I'm not a disrespectful person, I'm not going to be happy with that. So sometimes when we help people to see, well, that's not who you are, right? Are you happy with behaving that way? And the person might be like, not entirely, then you can say, well, what part do you want to apologize for, right? So they're not apologizing for everything because a lot of the times that's part of the problem, right? They think I'm apologizing. That means it's okay for them to do what they did. No, it's not okay. And that ties us back to forgiveness. Before we even offer apology, it's best to forgive. Forgive first and then offer that apology. But remember, forgiveness, that's a parallel process. That's it's with, with grieving. So it always comes, I, I shouldn't say always, but it usually comes back to the hurt, especially if there's a deep degree of hurt. It's good to resolve that first, process that first, forgive, and then proceed with the apology, regardless of whether or not there is um, reconciliation. But again, remember reconciliation takes two. So if the adult is expecting a change in behavior and they're not modeling that, that's an opportunity to kind of have a discussion with them too. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I so now welcome. I have a big understanding in my mind so I can talk to her. Thanks a lot. Excellent. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. All right. We got a couple more questions here. Um, the people keep hurting people continuously for generations, and you are now to explain that hurt to your own children, the next generation. How do you do it when you do not understand why it is happening? How do you raise a new generation to be forgiving? It's a very good question. Um, you know, if it's beyond the scope of your own personal relationship, I think it's worthwhile to consider with them, right? Again, after you look at the hurt, look at the hurt first, right? Address the hurt first, support them to, to, to process their hurt. Um, because that's one of the pieces that when we move to teach people to forgive and we move to teach them to have empathy for the people who've hurt them before they go through a healing process, that can actually be problematic because then we go through life thinking, okay, I have to forgive, I have to forgive. And it's the same as reconciliation. So it's okay if they hurt me. It's okay if they do this to me. I'm just going to forgive them anyways. That I don't, I, I don't, I don't endorse that kind of living. I do understand that as a healed person, you can handle pain. <laughs> but as a hurt person, it's a whole lot harder to deal with pain. Pain is going to come in life. So it's important to heal before we go out there in the world again and again and again, right? So um, after you've supported that healing, and sometimes it can happen together, but just be intentional about prioritize the healing first, um, then I think it's good to consider. You might not know for sure, but hypothesize. You know, I wonder why this person did that. You don't have the answer, but your children might have some ideas about why people do things the way that they do, right? So again, it's, it's, it's good to have this open dialogue with our kids and our teens. Um, we don't have to present as if we know everything because we don't, right? But what we do know is that children have a sense of, of for the most part, of a desire to heal and a desire to, to be happy, to be well. Right, so when pe when we forgive, it's not just about the other person. Forgiveness is about us, right? It also helps to see where there is power in forgiveness, right? It's an empowering experience. It's not just letting people off the hook. It's about saying, my life is going to be my life. My life is going to be good, right? Despite what people do, I'm going to go on and I'm going to have a good life. So I think those are really important messages that we get to believe for ourselves and then encourage our children to, to consider, right? Um, so the next question here, what happens if the same person keeps making the same mistake and you keep forgiving? Do you give up forgiving? Um, so for starters, um, if somebody keeps making the same decision, I wouldn't call it a mistake. A mistake implies an accident, an unintentional harm or decision. 
And the truth is, just because you're not thinking about it deeply or you're not thinking about me deeply doesn't mean that you're not doing what you're doing with intention. Like you are intentionally doing this. You have some degree of intelligence so you can see that when you do this, this happens and this happens and I get hurt in the process. So if you keep doing that, you keep doing that, you're not a safe person. You, your actions, you are telling me that you are not a safe person. I can forgive you, but will I choose to be in the same kind of relationship with you? Will I be in the same proximity? Will I be as close with you? Will I talk to you the same way? Will I see? No, I won't. That's your choice. You get to make a choice about the degree of closeness, the frequency of contact, of contact right? The degree of trust that you extend to this person. Just because I forgive you doesn't mean that I trust you, right? Reconciliation and healthy relationships, they're about trust. If the person is hurting you over and over and over, they're proving that they're not trustworthy. If somebody says, has a big sign and says, don't trust me, and you go, I forgive you, I'm going to trust you, you're signing up for it, right? Don't, do not trust them. Actions speak louder and longer than words. So if they're hurting you over and over and over again, they're saying, I am not ready to take care of you or be caring towards you. They're saying, I'm not ready. That's not your fault. It's not your job to make them ready. It's your job to say, you don't seem ready because this happens again and again and again. So when you're ready to do something different, and I don't just mean have intentions, when you have a good plan, when you have a good understanding, that takes us back to genuine apology. Right? If they're not telling you that they're ready to take responsibility and they have an understanding of where to get help, how to get help, and how to be different, then they're not ready for reconciliation. So it's, forgiveness is not reconciliation. Two very different things. Yes, forgive them. As well, there's an accountability piece that when they're ready for a healthy relationship, they will choose accountability. Let's talk about that for a moment because we got a little bit of time. One of my least favorite phrases in relationship in the world of relationship is holding people accountable. Mm -mm. Holding a people, that's what jails are for. That's what police are for, okay? <laughs> they hold people accountable who don't want to be held accountable. When you start trying to hold people accountable in relationships, you're holding them captive. And the fact that you have to hold on to them means that they don't want to be held, right? Healthy accountability means they show up and they say, this is what I'm responsible for. And this is what I'm going to do with my life and in my relationship with you. That's accountability, right? Everything else is you having expectations and putting them on them. And that doesn't really work out so well, right? So um, I definitely say forgive, but then be aware that it's different than reconciliation. And when people are ready for reconciliation, you will know, right? And if it's not obvious, then they're not ready, right? I hope, I hope that makes sense, okay? Um, it does. Thank you so much. And you really hit the nail on the head. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm glad. I'm really glad. This is a wonderful question. I know a lot of people can relate to that, right? Um, let's see. Okay, living in high crime neighborhoods, youth dying so often, so many funerals. Sadness, hurt, anger, loss, grief, all back to back again and again. It's hard to see forgiveness. I hear you. I hear you. I do. And that's why, you know, we're all different and we all have different calls and degrees of tolerance for pain. So some people may get to the forgiveness piece sooner. But again, um, it's that timing that's really, really important. Right. So even though I believe in forgiveness, I'm not going to rush and tell people to forgive. Right. You get to join and journey with people in their pain. And if it's you, that's what we get to do with you. Right. Again, there's a difference between experiencing grief and actually grieving. Right. You want to mourn, but then you want to grieve in a way that you move through a process. You want to acknowledge the loss. How is your life different? You want to deal with that pain right? Even to the experience of being able to breathe, you know, and <sighs> release some of that pain. That's important. Some people carry that pain with them. 
right? And again, every every tragedy and every trauma is going to reconnect with that previous one, right? So it's going to open up old wounds. And if you haven't healed well from those old wounds and you haven't moved through a process, then it's going to make it even more challenging, right? So again, we talked a lot about um, beliefs, right? When we When we're in pain and we're seeing this you know, this very, very hopeless picture in front of us. How do you introduce forgiveness when people are feeling hopeless, right? It's important to help people heal so that they can see that there is hope, right? And there is always hope. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that there's not hope, right? So that's, that's my uh, re 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 response to your to your comment. It is hard to see forgiveness. It is. It's hard to see forgiveness through grief, right? That's why we get to walk through that, walk that journey, walk that path, and then we will come to it. I believe that. Um, do even people who hurt feel hurt? Okay, the people who hurt, do they actually feel hurt? Do they know that they're hurting others? I'm imagining that's the question. How can I make sure that they are not going to hurt me again and again and again? That's a good question. Hmm. I don't know if um, everyone who is actually hurting people is aware that they are actually hurting people or that they are hurting themselves, right? That's something that you might have a better chance of answering when you think about this person's life. What do you know about them? Have they experienced pain? Have they dealt with the pain that they've experienced, right? When they cause you pain, do they acknowledge it? And when they acknowledge it, do you hear regret or do you hear remorse, right? Do you see the sorrow? Do you see the sadness? Do you see a repentant heart, right? If you don't, that's a sign that they're going to do it again, most likely. I can't predict the future. But in my experience, when you don't see that, it's likely going to happen again, right? So um, how can you make sure that they're not going to hurt you again? I, I can't guarantee that you can make sure of anything, but hurt is a lot less likely to happen when you adjust the proximity, right? So if they're not close enough to hurt you, there's less chance for you to be hurt, right? So it's important if somebody, if you're in a cycle of hurt, that you stop the cycle, okay? Safely stop the cycle and then give the person a chance to take care of their own stuff. It's important to know this is my stuff, this is their stuff. Because when we're in a cycle, Sometimes it has to do with our beliefs about forgiveness. We believe that we have to, or we choose this person because we know that they're good and we just hope that they will change. Well, you can do that from a distance. <laughs> you, can, you can let somebody know that you're hoping that they'll change and until they change, such and such and such is gonna be different. You can be clear to say, you know, I love you and I wanna be in relationship with you and I wanna be in a healthy relationship with you. This is what I'm responsible for, and this is what I'm not responsible for, right? And when they start to say, okay, yeah, I'm responsible, then you know they're, they're a, a safe person. And maybe that's what we'll talk about next time, you know, safe people in relationships and how that impacts our mental health, right? Um, very, very good question. Thank you, Dr. You're so Dr. welcome. You're so welcome. Um, even though reconciliation doesn't mean forgiveness, does that mean we should cut off everyone that does us wrong? Ah, cut off. That's so extreme, right? That's cut off. I, I think it depends on the degree of hurt, right? Um, if somebody is going to do you detriment, like detrimental harm, yeah, cut them off. <laughs> if you know this happens regularly and you don't want it to happen, you know, and there's a difference, again, to... My, my comment before, you can give people notice if it's safe to say that, you know what, this tends to be the pattern. This is what I'm responsible for, and I'm going to take care of myself. So if you want to address this with me, we can talk about that. But until then, I'm not going to do such and such and such and such and such, right? Um, that's not the same as a cutoff. That's like taking space. That's giving distance. But it's not like 
the, oh, I'm just taking space. No, you're being very clear. A, health, a principle of healthy communication is clarity. You want to be clear. I'm taking space. This is what I'm working on. And I would love it if you would work on this, but that's your choice, right? Now, if people, you know, if, if, if the hurt that people are causing you is not very significant, then you don't need to cut them off. If somebody looks poorly at you from across the hall, you know, at family meetings, and, you know, they got stuff to say about you. I mean, if you can tolerate that, you don't need to cut them off. But again, it's about proximity. It's not all or nothing, right? So you get to discern what changes I want to make in these relationships, right? Sometimes it's healthy for a clean break. And other times it's more about a clear conversation. Okay. I, I, I hope that was, was, was clear enough. Um, for those that have just joined us, okay, put your name in the email. Thank you. Um, question here. It's essential that we understand our own self-worth, practice self-reflection, daily affirmations. Forgiveness begins the healing process for you. I agree. Thank you for that comment. I, I do agree. Understanding our self-worth is, is key because when you do understand your value you let's let's put it this way there is a difference between being deserving and being worthy now some people have trouble saying that i am deserving of a certain kind of you know good treatment i deserve this right it it comes along with a sense of entitlement like you know but the truth is nobody's perfect nobody's perfect everybody has flaws so in my estimation you don't deserve anything because <laughs> nobody's perfect however imperfect people are still wonderful people you are worthy okay you are worthy of love and respect as long as you are alive and breathing like you are worthy of love and when you can love yourself that way then that sets the standard for other people i love me so there's no way I'm going to let you come into my life and not love me, <laughs> you know, treat me poorly. So just because you love me doesn't mean that you can hurt me, right? That's the loving. I, I love it when love flows into loving behavior. If you love me and your behavior isn't loving, we've got a problem. And it's a problem we can fix. It's a problem that you can fix. My job is for um, me to tell you <laughs> that I don't experience this as loving. That's my job. If you think that's loving and I don't think that's loving, well, that's why we have a problem. <laughs> you can go and love somebody else that way because that's not love to me, right? We want to really understand that and help people understand that because sometimes people don't know. That's what they came up with. That's what love means to them, right? Excellent. Well, look at that. This is, we're right at seven o'clock. Thank you so much for all these wonderful questions. I love it when people talk back to me. That's what this is like. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your time and your attention. And I trust it was um, helpful for you. All right. You're so welcome. You're so very welcome. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Blackwood. Really, like we all truly, truly love your presence, your energy, your knowledge, your wisdom. It's all really, really great. And I know everyone here that is with us today, um, I know that they're all excited to welcome you back as well. Um, thank so thank you. Really, thank you so much. Um, we will continue to stay in contact um, regarding our next workshop. And of course, everyone present here with us today, we will for sure let you know. Um, so that's why it's super important. Uh, before you go, if you could drop your name and your email, um, that way we will be able to send you the flyer and the link um, for our next workshop. Um, so again, thank you so much for all of you who have participated in our workshop today. Um, thank you for all the questions. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Blackwood for being us with here today. All right, everyone. Um, and as well, I know we had a question about the recorded Zoom. Um, due to the 
long duration of the Zoom meeting. Um, we will try our best to make sure that they will be on our YouTube page. Um, when we get those up there, we will for sure find the way to send the link straight to your emails. Um, that way you will be able to easily access them. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday.